Cases of Ed and Lorraine Warren. Case number 206. The Smurl Family Haunting. Chase Street. From 1974 to 1987, the Smurls claim that they were a mercy of ghosts after flood damage forced them from their Wilkes Barret home. Janet and Jack Smurl, along with their young daughters and Jack's parents, moved into a Chase Street duplex in West Pinston, Pennsylvania. A bit of a fixer-upper. They put their efforts into repainting, retooling and repairs. It was at this time that the eerie activity began. Initially, the episodes were benign. Tools went missing, then reappeared. Old wool stains seeped through the fresh coats of paint. Then the kitchen appliances caught fire, even though they were unplugged. An awful odour overwhelmed the house, only to disperse moments later. At first, the home seemed to be a good move for the family. Jack was promoted at work. The kids were excelling in school. The in-laws were happy. But that didn't last long. Soon, the smells were struggling to make ends meet. Mary, Jack's mother, suffered a heart attack. The ghostly visits, meanwhile, intensified. Mary and Janet claimed to have perceived voices that sounded like one another. Janet thought she heard her mother-in-law calling her name, while Mary thought she heard Janet and Jack in the throes of an argument, laden with the ex expletives. Ominous black masses formed and floated through the home. Janet said she was visited in the dead of night by a malevolent force that molested her in her sleep. Then Jack started experiencing the horror in his home. Lying in bed with Janet, he heard someone whispering, a young woman, it seemed. When he turned to face his wife, he watched a shadowy figure run up her leg. After that night, life in the small house grew darker. A light fixture fell from the ceiling, cutting one of the daughters on impact. The family dog was thrown against the wall. Janet said she was picked up by an invisible presence, dangling some six feet in the air, and then tossed across the room. Jack claimed a succubus entered the living room and raped him while a baseball game played on the TV. Even neighbours reported hearing screams from the house while the family was out. Terrified, the smells contacted Ed and Lorraine Warren. After inspecting the house, Lorraine Warren, a clairvoyant with several well-known paranormal investigations under her belt, concluded that the Smurls shared their home with four spirits, a harmless elderly woman, a young and possibly violent girl, a man who suffered and died in the home, and a demon that used the other three spirits to destroy the Smurl family. No more is known from that case, um, however I can read you some more. Let's have a look. Case 132 or 132. Werewolf. Bill Ramsey. Bill Ramsey was born and raised in Essex, a seaside town of Southend in the UK. His childhood would seem mostly normal, except for an incident when he was just nine years old. One memorable day, Ramsey was outside his back garden when he began to feel strange. It was a deep into one Saturday afternoon in 1952 when an icy blast of frigid cold swept all over him. A perspiration froze on his skin and a foul stench came closer to making him vomit. Close to making him vomit. The confused young Ramsey only had two things on his mind. Running away to a life on the beach and wolves. Oh, up to the beach and wolves. When he heard the distant call of his, of his mother, he snapped out of his trance. However, Ramsey was changed. Intense and pure rage had installed itself firmly with his psyche. Using this and the adrenaline fueled strength he now possessed, he had uprooted a fence post with the fence still attached and was swinging it like a club. Not even his parents could easily remove that post with their bare hands. What the young child did next made both of his parents flee back into the relative safety of their home, leaving Bill isolated outside. 
Bill Ramsey placed the wire meshing into his mouth and began gnawing at it. The cold sensations returned and a low growl emanated from deep within him. Both his parents remained inside the house until it was apparent that their son had calmed down considerably. Wolf dreams. For nearly 14 years after that terrifying incident, nothing had even remotely similar happened in the life of Bill Ramsey. He had grown up, got married and become a doting father of three. The first two years of his marriage, though were plagued by nightmares, each dream was the same and the results ended up identical as well. Ramsey always awoke in a cold sweat and was overwhelmed by feelings of dread and unease. In his dreams he always had a few steps behind his wife who would then turn to face him and run away in extreme terror. It was only in 1967 these dreams ended. 18 months on and Bill woke one night to hear what he thought was panting of a wild animal somewhere. Inside the bedroom, he was correct. It was Bill himself. Once again, there was a lull in activity for approximately 15 years. It was now 1983 and Bill was out with some friends at a local pub. After several drinks, Bill began to feel the same icy chills that first manifested much earlier in his life. He made an excuse and headed to the lavatory. Once there... He checked himself in the mirror and saw a wolf looking back at him. This was just a precursor as to what would happen on their way home. In the car ride home, and without any warning, Bill began to growl and immediately turned to his fellow passenger. Both hands twisted into claws, and Ramsey tried to bite the leg off his friend. The designated driver didn't panic. He brought the car to a stop and made the attempts to get the raging Bill out of the back of the car. It still took several minutes and quite a bit of effort to finally get Bill out of the car. By now, the frenzy had dissipated. The Sun newspaper documenting the story of Bill Ramsey. The Sun newspaper doc... Oh, that must be a mistake. Worse was to come, but not for another 18 months. Shortly before Christmas in 1983... Bill begins to suffer from chest pains and thought immediately turned to a possible heart attack. Bill checked himself into an emergency room of the local hospital and was halfway through a blood pressure exam when he sank his teeth into the arm of a nurse and ran to the ward as a man possessed. Witnesses would later reveal that Bill had hunched shoulders and both hands had curled into talons or claws and bared lips just like a rabid animal. Anyone that dared approach was knocked down easily with almost superhuman strength. It took quite a few people working as a team to finally subdue the raging man, rampaging man. A police officer managed to place handcuffs around Ramsey's wrists, but still this was not sufficient. A tranquilizer finally put an end to the outburst. The following morning, the tranquilizer had worn off, and so did the original transformation. After a hearty breakfast, the attending doctor listened to the whole story and recommended that Bill remains under their observation. However, he was a voluntary patient and was fully entitled to check himself out. Bill did so, but was back within the span of two months. In January 1984, Bill had just finished a visit to his mother, when he began to feel an attack coming on. He made it to the same hospital on the same terms as his previous visit. The attending nurse was alone with Ramsey in the emergency room and feared for her life. Once she told Ramsey that she was going to find a doctor, Ramsey threw to one side and lunged, lunged for an orderly. By chance, four police officers entered the hospital and immediately circled Ramsey. The officers and Ramsey had a standoff for a few seconds, until Ramsey began snarling and growling on all fours. The policemen advanced on Ramsey, who defended himself with some vigour. 
One of the four police officers suffered wounds so severe that he ended up in a hospital for another four days. All four managed to handcuff Ramsley again. The short walk to the waiting squad car went off without incident. As Ramsey had apparently regained his faculties. When he arrived at the local police station, they immediately summoned the police surgeon. Ramsey considered the suggestion of checking himself into a mental institution, but decided against it, citing the stigma that he might feel into the days to follow. Since he was clearly in control and rational, Ramsey was released. In the summer of 1987, he was back at the police station again. This time, however, he was much more public-spirited, having made a citizen's arrests to a local teenage prostitute. He drove her to the station. The second that he parked his car, she fled into the station. Ramsey once again felt the now familiar sensations surging from the middle of his chest, just as burly policemen approached the car. The officer, considerably bigger than Ramsey, started to question him and made the big mistake of gently touching Ramsey's arm. The wolf within him took immediate hold of Ramsey and the officer was thrown to the ground and was having the life choked out of him until help finally came. Ramsey was so wild that it took a dozen policemen a dozen policemen to hold him down and two injections to finally restrain him. For the next 10 days, countless MRIs, x-rays and psychiatric tests could not determine what was wrong with Ramsey. Clearly there was some issue that needed resolving. Nobody should really switch from the mild-mannered rational to rampaging berserker and back again in the space of a few minutes, unless there is something seriously wrong. The Warren visit London. The Warrens visit London. One thing that Bill that went in Bill's favour was the visit to London of America's demonologists Ed and Lorraine Warren. Bill's story appeared on a television show at the time of their stay. Lorraine immediately considered that Bill was being possessed and got in touch with the Southern Don Sea police station. After dialogue on both sides, the Warrens obtained the opportunity to talk to the Ramses. During an exorcism, an exorcism in Connecticut, Bill Ramsey begins to physically change into a werewolf. During an exorcism, oh, I've done it twice, sorry. The Warrens negotiated with Bill Ramsey and finally convinced him to come with their church in Connecticut and undergo an exorcism with their own specialist. Bishop Robert McKenna. Bill relented and made the trip with his wife in 1989. A tabloid newspaper, the people sponsored the trip. The night before the exorcism was due to take place, Ramsey tried to strangle his wife while she slept. When the exorcism finally began, actually began, Bill was not at all impressed. The service was being conducted in Latin and for half an hour nothing happened. Bill then took on an entirely different appearance. His face contorted and both hands formed claws. McKenna commanded the demon to leave. The full force of the werewolf fury descended onto McKenna one time and then disappeared for good. The whole event was recorded on film. Bill Ramsey last appeared in public in 1992 when he was updated of his progress. Just before his exorcism, the transformations were increasing in both frequency and seriousness. Since that time, there has no, has, there has been no recorded incidents. And there's the pictures just after, I'm assuming. There's Durin, which I see no contorting of the face. Um, yeah. Quite a looker. Those were, of course, a couple of the uh, Ed and Lorraine, Ed and Lorraine Warren's uh, cases. <laughs>